January the 17th, our morning service, we're continuing our series on heaven. You'll remember we began by looking at how to get to heaven, and we talked about Jesus being the prepared path for prepared people in order to get to that prepared place, and uh, Jesus is the one and only way. Then last time we looked at the importance of setting our affections on things of above, not on things of the earth, so we could be heavenly minded. And Jesus also taught us about being heavenly hearted, for our treasure is. We need to understand the importance of having a, a heart and a mind that's centered on heaven. Today we're going to jump into really the meat of the scripture, Revelation 21 and 22, and look at what the Bible says about heaven. So if you don't have your Bible with you, please take just a moment and uh, find your scripture. And you can follow along with me this on this video if you'd like to. Revelation 21 is where we'll begin in just a few moments. You know, I want to remind you, though, when we take this tour of heaven, that there are symbolisms being used. How do you describe something that's indescribable? I always took uh, a little bit of humor in the fact that the, uh, the Christian song, Indescribable, took about four and a half minutes to sing. You know, if it's, if it's indescribable, why does it take so long to describe it? But in Revelation, we see these symbols and these uh, ideas being presented because uh, the human vocabulary is not able to define the glories of heaven. So we're not going to be bothered by that. We're just going to take them as best we can as being the Word of God and apply them just as straightforward as possible so we understand what heaven's really like. So let's take this tour of heaven together. So begin with me in Revelation 21, verses 1 and 2. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I think it's important that we notice a couple of things. First off, heaven is a real material place. It is not some gaseous, uh, uh, you know, crazy place where we just float around on a bunch of clouds and look like we don't have real body. It is a material, physical place. Uh, in this passage of Revelation, he sees the new heaven and the new earth. Again, Jesus went to prepare this place. Jesus is not simply preparing a state of mind. This is not some kind of Gnostic idea. This is a very real place where very real, literal, resurrected bodies will be going. And it is a place where they will be walking and worshiping. Uh, it is a place for the resurrected to enjoy eternity. Jesus, following his resurrection, had a physical body that Thomas could touch. The other uh, apostles saw, and, and Jesus ate food with them. So he had a very real body and we will also. The Bible mentions this new heaven and this new earth, and this new Jerusalem is the capital that comes down out of this new heaven. But the Bible speaks of new Jerusalem. It speaks of the new Jerusalem being prepared as a bride. Now, I, weddings are fascinating things, aren't they? We spend all kinds of money and all kinds of energy and all kinds of attention, and that bride is the best dressed, presented she'll ever be in her life because she's giving herself fully to her husband. There's no better image that the Bible could present than the bride and groom. I want you to understand something. The best we have is we give ourselves to Christ as his church, as his bride. And this picture here is the new Jerusalem as the bride being adorned with gorgeous and uh, unimaginable beauty to be presented to Christ who will be its king. What a great picture it is. The bride speaks as New Jerusalem as a bride, best prepared for this intimate relationship, this oneness Jesus and his church will have throughout the ages. Well, who's the governor of heaven? Look at verses 3 through 8 with me. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. He will dwell with them, they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for those former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write these words, for they are faithful and true. And then he said, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will give to him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. And he that overcometh shall inherit all things. I will be his God, he will be my son. But the fearful, unbelieving, and abominable murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. 
Heaven's this majestic place where God will rule in majesty in heaven. Now, the speaker here is Jesus himself. I am faithful and true, but God dwells with his people in heaven. Water of life is given freely, so all your needs will be met. You won't be lacking for anything. Because the Lord rules in majesty in heaven, we're told there are uh, some things that no longer exist. I love this. There's no more sorrow. Look at verse 4. God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. I think it's important to understand that the tears don't get wiped away until Revelation 21. Don't lose sight of that. Christians will be called as witnesses the judgment of unbelievers. I believe there'll be tears flowing. But it's here where God gets that great handkerchief and wipes away all tears from their eyes. And there should be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, nor shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. There's coming a great time when God will turn every tear to a triumph, every hurt to a hallelujah, and every Calvary to an Easter. You understand, victory is certain. There'll be no more tears, no more grief, no more sighing, no more dying, no more disease. Friend, there'll be no more sin. And let me just share a thought with you here. In addition to no more sin, you will never be tempted to sin. You see, the battle of the Christian life is, is the war against temptation. You know, the, 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 the devil beating you up, the, the world trying to get you to sin, and all the, the bombardment upon your heart and soul that comes daily. All those temptations will be gone. There'll be no more. Those former things, they're passed away. Sin is what's messed up the planet. Sin is what's messed up homes. But sin that is behind every sorrow and every heartache and every pain will be done away. You see, we live now in a world that has the curse of sin upon it. But on that day, the curse will be gone. Unfortunately, we are reminded in verse 8 that there are some who will not go to heaven. Now, folks, if we're going to believe in a literal heaven, we have to be consistent and believe in a literal hell because the Bible presents both. You do understand that. If you're not a part of Jesus, if you've not accepted his gift of salvation, you will not spend eternity in heaven, but you will indeed spend eternity in a devil's hell. And all the glory that the Bible paints for heaven doesn't even amount to all the agony the Bible presents for those who are in hell. I challenge you, know the governor of heaven. His name is Jesus. So that you can experience what we'll call the glories of heaven that are presented to us in verses 9 through 21. Now, in this passage, we see all the things that we're to consider. They're indescribable in their beauty. They're used symbolically, and, and they're used to give us a greater lesson of all the things about heaven. First, we see that Jerusalem is the only capital city in heaven. The source of that city is it comes down from God. Look at verses 9 and 10. And there came to me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues. And he talked with me, saying, Come up hither, and I'll show you the bride, the lamb's wife, and he carried me in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. You see, the source of that city is God. This means it's already in heaven. It is being prepared. And those who uh, are dead already, those who are believers, they're the first fruits of the resurrection. They're already there. This reminds us Jesus said he was preparing that place. But what about the sights of that city? Oh my goodness, look at the sights of that city. Let's begin with verse 23 of Revelation 21. It says, In that city has no need for a sun, neither the moon to shine, for the glory of God did light it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. You see, there'll be no more moon, no more sun, no more stars. Now, honestly, I know a lot of you will be a little disappointed because there'll be no more sunrises or sunsets. And I think one of the reasons those are so extremely gorgeous is because those are one of the things that we can enjoy to be reminded of God's majesty. But Jesus will be the light in heaven, and there'll be no more night. So there'll neither be no sunset nor sunrise. You see, that city is going to be beautiful. It's a city of gold. The gold is so pure, it's translucent. There are colored jewels and other brilliant colors. It has walls of jasper. Now, the walls there are not to keep us in because the gates are open. The walls are not there to keep the wicked out, for they're in hell. The walls are there for the glory of God. They are... Uh, monuments to his glory and they are ornamental of his glory the walls of that city 
We're told they have the names of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Look at Revelation 21, verses 12 through 14. And had a great wall and high and the 12 gates and the 12 gates, 12 angels. And the names written thereon are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the walls of the city had 12 foundations. And in them was the name of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. You see, in heaven, the Jews and the Gentiles will be one. We will be united in Christ as never before. Now, there is a little bit of discussion about who the 12 apostles are on the 12 foundations. Well, Judas was an apostle, but he defiled, and nothing that defiles is in heaven, so it's not Judas. The early apostles elected a man named Matthias to join their number to complete the 12. And yet the Bible tells us the apostle Paul was called as an apostle out of season. So I don't know who the 12 apostles are. I can tell you 11 of them. The 12th one will either be Matthias or Paul. I don't know which. But those are two logical choices as we consider the glory of that city. Notice also the sounds of the city. Look at the song of the redeemed. Look at uh, Revelation 15, if you can go back a couple pages. And the singing in that city. They sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are all thy ways, thou King of saints. Our world today really looks to Moses in ways... It doesn't look to Jesus. All of the great religions of the world look back to Abraham. But I want you to understand something. In heaven, we'll rejoice in the faithfulness of all the Old Testament saints, all the Old Testament patriarchs. But the song that will matter most, great and marvelous are thy works, is the song of the Lamb, Jesus. The sounds of that city will be focused on Jesus. What about the size of that city? Look at verses 12, 15 and 16 with me. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the walls thereof. And the city lays four square and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and breadth and the height of it are equal. Now the city is four square at its foundation, about 15 miles in each direction, 15 miles high, wide, and deep. The base of that city would be roughly 225 million square miles miles at its base 225 million square miles at its base now the state of alaska our largest state here in the united states is about 660,000 square miles so the city new jerusalem heaven about 1500 miles wide at its base so if you drew a line across the top border of florida all the way over to arizona up into the montanas back over to new jersey and then straight back down to florida that's about 1,500 miles square. Now, the U.S. mainland is about 300 million square miles, so you can see the, the shape there. It's a big, big city. Now, when it's 15,000 miles at its width and height and base, that presents three different possibilities for shape. Some scholars believe vehemently that it's a square because it's high and wide and deep. Well, those measurements would work if heaven were a square. Others say, no, it's a diamond. It's that square just shifted. And so the measurements are still true, but it's more of a diamond shape with maybe the throne being the centerpiece. Others have argued, no, it's a pyramid, that the base has the, the three dimensions and it falls in and is that high. The Bible doesn't make it clear to us which it is, but we know it's huge. Now you say, well, maybe that's not that big. It doesn't seem to be all that big. It's big enough. It will hold everybody it needs to hold. What about the sanctuary of that city? Look at verses 22 and 23. I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. The city had no need for sun, neither of moon to shine, for the glory of the Lord did light it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. The Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. You understand the Old Testament temple was a prophecy concerning Jesus. It had a gate. Jesus said, I am the door. The Old Testament temple had an altar, and Jesus shed his blood for us. It had a place for ceremonial cleansing. The Word of God cleanses us from all our stains. It had a table of bread on it. Jesus said he was the bread of life. The Old Testament temple had the golden candelabra, but Jesus is the light of the world. It had incense which were burned, but Jesus is now the great high priest. You see, Jesus is the sanctuary of heaven. 
He's the centerpiece of heaven. Everything that matters in heaven centers around Jesus. Can I encourage you tonight? Can I challenge you? Heaven will not be yours if you don't know Jesus. If you have any questions about what it means to know Jesus, please go to our website, fbc-sellersburg.org. We have a link at the top that says, Need Hope, the Gospel. And in that link, we simply explain to you how you're a sinner and you need a Savior. And Jesus is the one and only. And if through repentance of your sin towards God, you'll confess Jesus as your Savior, you can be born again. You can be on that path to heaven. Jesus is the sanctuary of heaven. The sounds, the sights, the size of heaven, all that is distinguished to make Jesus and his glory through all the ages to be enjoyed by those who are redeemed. I trust you are. If not, I challenge you to go to our website. Pray a prayer that's suggested there and invite Jesus to be your Savior and Lord. Make him your Redeemer so that heaven can be yours. Father, I'm praying in Jesus' name that you'll speak to our hearts and encourage us and challenge us to be more like you. Thank you that you are the centerpiece of heaven and that we can rejoice in your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.